the ways in which the internet as it's currently conceived is under crisis. Our second panel on the weirdness of the mental states of the net, very much a mm, referendum on where we find ourselves today. And then finally, we're moving into the third portion, which is going to be what are some alternatives? What are ways to re, 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 reboot the system? And we have a number of exciting presentations. We're gonna be beginning with Ramesh, who is a faculty at UCLA, a researcher on the uses of technology, not only from the critique from a decolonial perspective, but also a grounded analysis of how other communities um, approach technology and an overall policy-minded focus to how we can actually create a world that we might want to live in. We're also going to have Tim, who has done really extensive security research uh, with great technical know-how, but also from an arts-based perspective, and so it's not going to be too terribly dry, rolling into a presentation about crypto party, um, not necessarily cryptocurrency, but crypto as in how to say safe, obscure, and protected online to obscure or occlude your identity. And then finally, Dan, who will talk about some of the different ways in which uh, trans and other vulnerable people use technology to protect themselves, to help navigate the world and empower themselves in the process. So we're getting really into the nitty gritty of the practical here, which I think sends us off to a good message. We'll have a short break, well, actually long break, maybe a few hours, give you a chance to go around downtown or run some errands, and then come back for an exciting performance by Hirt Lovink and a discussion with Ben Grosser. Um, but I won't preview those right now, I will at the end of the panel. So without any further ado, let's invite our first uh, presenter, Ramish. All right, hi everybody, how are you? Good? Let's put some, let's get a little bit of energy here. We're gonna be moving, we're gonna be, we're gonna be moving into a more progressive, activist-minded, social movement-minded, imagination-opening direction, I hope, here. Um, so, so, oh, here's some ways you can follow me. That's Twitter, that's not Instagram, Sasha, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's my Twitter handle. Okay, so, um, f you know, while I was conducting research for my last book, thank you, um, which is called Beyond the Valley, I had an opportunity to talk to a number of figures, a lot of leading politicians, uh, you know, kind of on a global level, tech CEOs, as well as sort of insiders in various sorts of large data-oriented corporations. And every single one of them, without fail, within a minute or two, would describe their organizations or their companies as AI companies. And I think that's really interesting. I have a back, very, very mixed background myself, but I was an AI developer about 20 years ago. And when we were developing AI systems, our interests were in semantics. How do we make meaning? How does the mind function? Almost all of that that basically is, is expressed as AI today is not semantic. It's all based on pattern recognition, correlation, and quantification, right? So if you think of yourself as a living being, a life force, a source of energy, and then you think of yourself as expressed through a series of numbers, what we call quantification, as an individualized data body collected by someone else who knows who exactly, we know kind of everybody is collecting data about us, except perhaps ourselves on some level. And that is a representation of you. So increasingly, many of us have that strange sort of anxious and I would say sometimes delirious feeling that we are basically being subject to models being constructed about ourselves through quantification and individuation. Two key points, individuation and quantification that are representations of ourselves. And the outputs of those models pump through algorithms that might be dopamine obsessed or attention hoarding or whatever it is that a third party wants out of us become more or less expressions of our identity. So I think a number of the artistic pieces I've seen today sort of express that sort of, uh, what are we gonna say, dystopic anxiety. And what I wanna do is call the system out, describe some of the contours of these systems of quantification, surveillance, dystopic kinds of questions that this conference, I think, is focusing on, but also speak to alternative pathways that are in our hands as human beings around this planet right now. 
So I think many of us know this, and this is something in scholarship we call political economy. We look at the political and economic systems that shape our lives as we go. But essentially, our experiences online, especially over the last 15 years, are ones that are mediated by t corporations that describe themselves as technology corporations, but they're really that and so much more. The biggest media company in the history of the world is, is Facebook slash Meta. It's a media company, right? The biggest transportation company in the history of the world could be considered Uber, right? And we can go on and on and on, right? So private corporate mediation through a so-called public internet become the gateways and pathways to life futures, economic futures, social futures, and so on. And like any for-profit company or valuation-oriented company, which I'm gonna speak about in a moment, the entire goal and business model, which they've been quite successful at, and by the way, that's Alibaba, that's third there, but we can substitute it with Amazon, is to hire almost nobody and own almost nothing, right? Think about that with Uber, with Uber drivers, right? I have many of my former students at UCLA who are making under $5 an hour if you control for costs and inflation, driving for Uber with an undergraduate degree from UCLA, right? So any labor are seen, labor practices are extraneous appendages to systems of accumulation of revenue, profit, or valuation. And we, that's why we saw this sort of disturbing trend occur as we became more and more technologically dependent during the pandemic, right? I don't know how many of us were daily Zoom users before the pandemic started, but many of us certainly became that. And even the he former head of the University of California, Janet Napolitano, <laughs> joined the board of Zoom right around the time of the start of the pandemic. And some of us were w asking some questions about that as well, right? So, Ownership of data can be connected to revenue generating practices and therefore profitability potentially, but it is an asset, it's a speculated asset in and of itself. And that last point I think is extremely important. Uber is a good example of this. That's a company that's been barely profitable, yet worth at various times hundreds of billions of dollars. So what we see occur, and we actually saw this occur at a certain date during the pandemic, was maximal IPO valuation, so corporate, tech, you know, corporate valuation, right? IPO, basically stock market valuation, with lower GDPs than ever. So even if you use a classical capitalist macroeconomic playbook, no longer are classical indicators of success of capitalist economies correlated to stock market valuation. This is what the economist in Greece who I've been working with a little bit on the side, Yanis Varoufakis, describes to me as the zombification of capital that is part of technological industries. And I think that's really important. We have very interesting juxtapositions at this time, which you know, some people call a techno-feudalist system. We see a massive amount of valuation in the hands of just a few companies and their investors and their execs and everybody else with almost nothing, right? So that can be reflected in labor statistics, in the Gini coefficient, which is an expression of, of, of macroeconomic inequality. But even if you look at GDP, which you, you know, is kind of like the, the bedfellow of a thriving sort of traditionally capitalist, even a, you know, even a corporate sort of system, that no longer is positively correlated to tech corporate valuation. And I think that's very, very interesting if you juxtapose it with these very sobering statistics. For the first time in the history of the United States, the youngest generation is making less than its parents. I know, not celebrating and not celebrating, right? We're all crying and laughing at the same time, right, man? So it's like the youngest generation is the first generation in the history of the United States to make less than its parents if you control for inflation. And so this is what my students are talking with me. I, have, I teach every year 18 to 21 year old students at UCLA and we're all like buddies and I've noticed this over time. People even ask me, why did my parents have me? Why did my parents have me? Because life expectancy is also decreasing in the United States and these statistics are both true in the United Kingdom as well. So what we see with the, this is not about technology but it's the forces that drive technology, right? Expansion and valuation and eradication of all else. 
And this reflects an extremely limited macroeconomic set of analyses that are dystopian, even for, <laughs> even for the execs and the investors, I, I argue. Because there is a number of Nobel Prize winning economists who have done their work in what we call externalities, which are the non-economic effects of economic transactions. So if you have an extremely narrow model of corporate valuation that tends to be dysfunctional in many different ways, where it's not per, no longer about profitability, and everybody else in a country with three people with equivalent wealth to 185 million, three to 185 million. In the world, eight people with equivalent wealth to 3.95 billion. Eight people equivalent wealth to four billion, approximately, right? How is this gonna, how is this gonna play out? Where is the system gonna go? And what, where do we all stand in relation to these troubling and deeply important macroeconomic dynamics? And what is a digital economy slash society, meaning a society, economy, a world that is increasingly mediated by digital technologies look like in the image of collective being? That's the question I wanna ask. So as Andrew mentioned, and thank you Andrew for inviting me to this conference, I have worked on these issues because ultimately what I deeply care about is a compassionate, humane, equitable, just, diverse, and not in a BS diverse way, but a real diverse <laughs> digital world. A multivocal, a polyvocal digital world. And so how do we get there? So I am sort of agnostic about the ways in which I wanna fight for that world, meaning I'll do anything and everything. And Andrew even alluded to that I work in policy. That's not because I like policy, it's super boring for me. I'm very much a theorist and an activist and a scholar, you know, kind of a social science oriented scholar. But I wrote policy on these issues for Senator Sanders national campaign in 2020, which was our best crack at this. I currently advise Ro Khanna and Jamal Bowman and AOC on the side in, in, New York City, in, in New York State. So we're all trying to do something about these issues. We wrote policy on gig economy, we wrote policy on surveillance issues, we wrote policy on, on supporting investments in community networks, in bottom-up modes of technology generating economy, employment, positive economic outcomes for everybody involved. And I think these are, so policy frameworks can help us with some of these issues. Um, so with that in mind, I wanna talk also about what I think is occurring more and more. And this is something that's actually been uh, part of my own personal life, right? So I came up, I, I have multiple degrees in engineering. I'm a Stanford graduate from the late 1990s. I have, I guess we could say friends or people I went to, college with who are bazillionaires, one, one, of, one, of the, one of whom every time he comes to LA buys out the Chateau Marmont and the entire block associated with it. And in our engineering education, because I was in classes with these folks, we didn't learn anything about sociology, <laughs> philosophy, questions of life and ecology, what it means to be human, what it means to be alive, economics, any of these issues, and part of the issue is our engineering education is increasingly, and, 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 and even at the time that I was studying, very differentiated, separated from other modes of inquiry, right? But now we know that questions about technology and data and engineering are no longer merely technical questions. If you engineer for society, even with good intentions, without really understanding society, because society is not some blanket statement, it's complex and differentiated, you engage in social engineering, right? So that's why a systemic uh, way of addressing, acknowledging, and dealing with these issues is critical. And I wrote this piece with my friend Peter Bloom back during the pandemic because I increasingly am seeing that many of the magnates driving technologization in their own directions in this world seem to have a bordered sense of understanding, a bordering, right? A sort of striation in terms of their own uh, desire to deal with the rest of us, let alone a planet of other living non-human beings. And I think that's really interesting to see space as a certain type of fetish that might relate to a certain kind of fatalism and escapism that's connected to those driving the contours of technology, right? So when you're driving the contours of technology, yet you're like, I'm out of here, what does that mean, right? So, Thinking about space in relation to such as a, as, a, as a sort of standpoint from a feminist theoretical uh, perspective, what does space represent in relation to all this? So it's increasingly well known 
that many of the algorithms we engage with are, are optimized for our attention, right? And so in classical industrial capitalism, when we talk about Marxist concepts of surplus value, the idea is that there were inputs, right? The input could be land and nature. The input, the input could be women who are essentially disregarded in traditional capitalist systems, which is the basis of early feminist thought. The input could be labor, right? Those modes, those inputs would be exploited and surplus value would be obtained through profit making and capitalist accumulation. This is classic Marxist stuff. But what if you add to the mix the input ingredients of dopamine, cortisol, and adrenaline as raw ingredients of digital capitalism? Just to provoke you a little, right? So if, our, if these hormones, if the biological, right, the neurological, the neurochemical are inputs into systems that are concocted to drive us crazy, dope us up, outrage us, create anxiety and so on. Again, that's not because of semantic algorithms. It's all based on correlation, right? So all of these systems are what lend to the very mainstream. And I sometimes speak, I literally gave a talk in Munich at the pre-Davos conference just like a few days ago, a very similar talk. So, but I can make these arguments in these spaces and say things like this and people are like, oh wow, holy shit, right? So I want, I want us to really recognize what are the inputs and outputs and what part of this involves our bodies, our minds, our affect, our spirit, and so on. So one thing that I do, because my last book, it was my third book, was written in a journalistic way. That's extremely important for me and some of you know that I'm a host sometimes on the Young Turks and I, and I do a lot of work in the progressive space here in, in LA and other parts of this country and world, is I had off the record contact through random people I met with, the, with those that run the, ran the organization called Cambridge Analytica. I was talking with them for about a year and a half and got them to agree to do an on the record interview right when this went down, right when they folded. I was literally on a plane to the UK about to interview Alexander Nix when this went down. And what an organization like Cambridge Analytica did, whose um, vice president was Steve Bannon and was founded by Robert Mercer, who's a computational linguist with multiple patents. There's good work on this in The New Yorker by Jane Mayer, I think is her last name is attempt to use psychographic algorithms, right? Again, the Skinner machine idea, right? We can influence behavior or we can feed you with content to influence, arouse, outrage, string you out, make you go insane a little bit, right? So psychographic, psychometric models. But the key point here, and this is something I think all of us know, but I just wanna underscore it, is that, and Lauren showed this in her presentation, I think in a really powerful way, almost anything and everything we do leaves so-called, what we call digital footprints, right? Like our credit cards, when we're picked up by a surveillance camera, right? Internet of things sorts of systems, smart city systems, these are all leaving digital uh, records, right? So what Analytica did, which I think is pretty interesting, is they aggregated data. So like the Ramesh Srinivasan you're engaging with now might be a somewhat formal professor version of me. My friends who are sitting here in the front row know me in a totally different way, right? But these different modes of identity should be ones that we have power over. This to me is a question of being human itself. Certainly a question of democracy, right? The right to be. But what if all these different modes of my own identity, like what I do in the supermarket, what I do at home, what I do when I'm hanging out with my friend Sasha, what I'm doing when I'm talking with you, Andrew, are aggregated. Disaggregated identity is aggregated through the composite of digital footprints to construct an identity. This is what Analytica was doing because I don't know how many of you know this, but I could buy every one of your credit card records that are here in this room right now. So it might be one thing to you know, you mine data based on my curated selfie identity that I might put out on Instagram. I don't have Instagram, but if I did. But that's totally different than my maybe, you know, going to the 7-Eleven at night and buying like a bunch of like, you know, toxic cigarettes, right? Totally different thing, or buying 40s, even better, right? So, so it's like these aggregations of self, right? And so Irving Goffman, the, the anthropologist, wrote a classic text about the presentation of self, right? And he argued that we have, that we can present ourselves in different ways in different environments, but the self now is not only collapsed into quantification controlled by third parties, but it's also 
uh, aggregation of these forms of quantification. So there's a different notion of the self that's constructed, spat out through these models, because what Analytica did was use the ocean model, which is uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeable, neurotic. So it's like, it's like could, could map you, Andrew. It might be like, Andrew, you're open when you're around new people, but you're neurotic at seven in the morning when you're talking to your significant other, or what have you, right? So it's these multiplicitous ways of looking at identity, not just through data, but through dynamic models of identity. So this is important because think about back to the earlier slide I showed with the Airbnbs and, and Facebook and so on, right? The Economist has a study that, that suggests that about 47% of existing jobs will be uh, lost to various forms of automation. That's a bit of a highly oversimplified study, and it's been critiqued a number of ways. However, what is lost in all of it is the question of labor. What do jobs of the future look like that work with technological transformations, right? Because many gig jobs, as we know, are highly exploited, non-unionized, non-living wage based, non-benefits based, you know, and, 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 and now these days, you know, what Sarah Roberts earlier likely spoke about, I missed her talk, it was, it was essentially, you know, exploited content moderation in some ways could, is, 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 is now seen as a step up compared to the Elon Musk version of the world, which is like better AI and fire everybody, right? Rather than recognize that there could be an army of journalists worldwide being hired to work with, to ground, to audit, to collaboratively design, to even, to even make decisions that actually have power over when algorithms would not be present, to push for digital transparency, but even more importantly, accountability, right? There could be a huge new world where many could be hired in this space. So a regenerative vision of a digital economy looks at what can be generated out of collapse, right? And I think that that is very, very important here. And so for many people who are like universal basic income supporters, I know like Andrew Yang, when he ran for president, kind of made that his, uh, his big like talking point. In a vacuum, sure, that sounds good, but we also need to recognize why Sam Altman, for example, who's the founder of Y Combinator, I interviewed him for my book too, and is also the head of OpenAI, which is what re released ChatGPT and just decided to move to a profit model after being a nonprofit. Why is Sam funding UBI studies in Stockton, in the hood? You know? why, why are many tech leaders interested in UBI? Because if we are worth nothing, like 99.9% .9 of us, what is our data worth, right? So what if I proposed a model that was much more all, lift all boats, right? Uh, rather than this kind of handout into a broken system. So my colleague Anand Giridharada, some of you might have read his book. He's someone I've been talking to for a few years. He wrote a great book called Winners Take All, right? Basically looking at these, at Davos, at Aspen, and all these places where everyone's celebrating their humanitarianism and their philanthropy while writing the rules into systems that ensure that they don't pay any taxes, et cetera, right? So, what about a universal basic dividend model where any investment that was made by the public into some sort of infrastructure like the internet, like roads, right? That any private corporation builds itself off of, that some percentage should be owned by everybody, right? What if we all owned 10% of Google? And as Google's appreciated in its value, all of us could, could also appreciate. Why can't we have a model like that, right? a universal basic dividend model. That's another way of looking at things, right? So, you know, those Amazon trucks that are combing the streets all around where we live, they are using roads that we paid for. And I work at UCLA where the ARPANET was established, right? Which was paid for by United States taxpayers by, you know, with my colleague Leonard Kleinrock. So, these are very important issues because I think right now we're at a time where a planetary consciousness is critical. I mean, certainly the pandemic showed us that. Certainly climate issues show us that. These macroeconomic dysfunctional inequalities show us that. So during my sabbatical, and I'm gonna tell you, now I'm gonna to shift to tell you a few stories for the latter half of this talk. I had an opportunity to spend some time with my colleague Ashil Bembe, who's a professor in Johannesburg. Ashil's been a big influence on me. And Ashil talks a lot about this question of how do we want to share the planet? He also speaks quite a bit about and writes quite a bit about borders, right? 
not just physical borders, but borders in so-called online or cyber spaces, right? And this larger question of, in an increasingly digitally mediated world, who gets to move and who doesn't, right? We know sub-Saharan Africans don't get to move, or they die and they get murdered in the Mediterranean. We know that the US border is extended to Chiapas, essentially. I've seen that firsthand, to the Mexico-Guatemala border. That who gets to move, right? and who doesn't get to move is a discuss in, in a planet that's increasingly uninhabitable because of climactic issues and because of the, the, the infiltration of human life into lives of non-humans, which we can see the pandemic is tied to. Climate issues are related territory issues to pandemic issues from this perspective, right? So the question that Ashil asks that I wanna just echo and that I think about constantly, it, what, it, what, what does it look like? What does a world look like that involves technology where we are truly sharing this planet, including sharing online space? What is a world of mobility where all can move, both physically and digitally look like, right? Because we all know that folks in Africa might create a website, but that website won't move in the sense that it won't be visible. Just try Googling Cameroon, which I did for a piece I wrote for Quartz. I didn't find a single web page from Cameroon, which is where Ashil is from, till I got to page three of Google, right? I saw the CIA's representation of Cameroon in the first three search results. So the point I wanna make here, and this is my transition to the latter half of this talk, is that individuation and quantification is an example of bordering, right, of fragmentation. It's a certain kind of uh, rendering something static rendering something incarcerated, right? And then in contrast to that, when we look at realities of being alive and life itself, even on an ecological level, it's not individuated, it's relational. And I wanna just give you a few examples of such. I'm gonna be a little wild here, so I'm just gonna be very fast with this. First of all, some of you know this, and Kert knows this, I think. 12 years ago, I was, I was in, based in Tahrir Square, so for three years, three summers, three, four months of a year per three years, I was doing my field work, looking at this whole misnomer, our technologies saved them. <laughs> the Facebook revolution, the Twitter revolution, total bullshit. But what was more interesting than that were the modes of networking, including t you, the use of technologies of all kinds, including the technology of a flyer on the street, including the technology of a photocopier, including the technology of graffiti and murals, Right? What are the, those modes moved people out of individualism toward collectivity, toward what we call collective action in social movement work, right? And there's a lot more I can say about this, but I had, an, I had the blessing of, of speaking with and interviewing people like Allah Abdel Fattah. Some of you might have heard of him. Allah was the main human rights blogger in Egypt, which you would, at that time, which you would, you would ask the question, why would that matter? Almost nobody was online and even fewer had social media. And those that were on there were very demographically homogenous, including even, except the Muslim Brotherhood, which I can talk about. But basically, I saw how people were subversively using media practices, media tools of all kinds, tactical media practices, to, inf to use platforms like Twitter, not to reach people in their own country, but to infiltrate and influence global journalism that would be remediated at times back into the country through satellite television. So these are the practices of moving beyond this sort of completely in the dark, individuated, super anxious, stressed out, dystopian, what the hell are we gonna do kind of vibe that's taken over pretty much all of our experiences with social media and tech, and has built brands for tech critics like Tristan Harris, right? But he doesn't give us a path forward. So what we could do instead is look at the reality of life and ecology, right? So those of you who know me decently well know that I practice meditation, pra practicing Buddhist, it changed my life in a very significant way about 20 years ago. And one of, uh, a teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, many of you have heard of, Thai, has often said there is no such thing as the lotus flower without the mud. And this is a concept that's very commonly applied in Buddhist cosmology, in Hindu practices, in tantric theories, and so on, where you see the relational as the identity, right? And you don't see individuals as atomizedly distinct. 
And I think that's a really, really important concept to recognize that in being human, our relationships, our actual thriving relationships are porous and diffuse, and we don't exist in a merely self-contained way, despite systems that order us in such a way, including game theoretic systems that John Nash himself said, beautiful mind, John Nash himself said as he was dying were created by him and designed by him as a result and connected to his own schizophrenia at that time. So there are many, many practices, and I write about this in my books and articles and so on, where the, the, the non-humans and humans exist in an assemblage. They exist in relationality with one another. Space is not something that you map in a quantifiable and distant way. Space is something you move through. And this is an example of what people describe as an aboriginal, Yonggu, North ter Northern Territory, North Arnhem Land, songline. This doesn't fit a Cartesian understanding of mapping, but it's a representative of a story it's also representative of anthropomorphized beings. Actually, they're not anthropomorphized. They're embraced for being non-human. Excuse me, the opposite of anthropomorphized. And you actually know the map by walking the land. So all of these distinctions we have ontologically, walking versus seeing, animal versus human, land versus mind, mind versus body, are collapsed in many, 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 many systems, and believe it or not, even in our Western cultures, we have many examples of such as well. So what I want to do is tie this to work and field work I've been doing, looking at regenerative systems out of this extractive digital economy, where it's not just hormones that are extracted, it's also rare earth minerals, right? And this is part of a deeply unequal world, an unjust world. But it also connects to an African story. And I've been doing field work in different parts of East Africa, especially the last few years. And we know that many rare earth minerals that are in these devices, right, like cobalt, tungsten, coltan, and so on, are found in places like the Congo, in Rwanda, and Central Africa. A lot of lithium found in Afghanistan. People don't know that. In Bolivia as well. These rare earth minerals are extracted to create devices that are necropolitical. They are designed to die. They are designed to die. Planned obsolescence, they admit it, right? But then what happens is these devices, like so much other trash, is externalized, out of sight, out of mind. It's at the Pacific gyre. <laughs> it goes back to Africa, which I think is very interesting. So there's a certain cyclicality, right? So Africa is this objectified standpoint. It's what Ashil describes as a paranoid construct and projection of psychoanalytic guilt, I think is very interesting when we try, tie that to even questions of blackness and how black peoples are treated and, and murdered in this country. It's psychoanalytic, right? And I, had, I spent two weeks during this sabbatical in Mercato, which is the biggest open air market. It, you, any of you all want to come and hang out with me there? Trust me, it's worth your while. It's the biggest open air market in, in, in well, it's in Ethiopia, but it's in, in all of East Africa. I spend two weeks there for hours every day, looking at how every form of imaginable uh, that one might consider waste, you gotta hustle, you try to create value out of waste. You breathe life into death. And I don't ever wanna fetishize this, even though it sounds like I might be, but this is what an unequal, a brutal world, what Ashil calls brutalism, a brutal world looks like, right? But at the same time, it's remarkable because it's a reminder of something very, very powerful, which is the power of human creativity. And it allows us to take this definition of innovation, which is another like bullshit branding term that's used by uh, Silicon Valley, to maybe think that innovation means resourcefulness, doing more with less, hustling, rigging, you hear these terms all the time, subverting, reassembling, and so many of you maybe know that Ethiopians and e Ethiopia and Ethiopians are very proud of their coffee. I mean, the coffee's amazing there. <laughs> and I even noticed, I've got to show this picture next time I give this talk, um, a Nescafe, like Nescafe is the worst thing ever for these people and kind of all of us, right, who like coffee. And somehow I, saw, I, found, that I found this guy who was just selling Nescafe used plastic bottles, but he was just like, kind of, uh, what do you call that? Like erasing the Nescafe off of that. 
and then selling it to people, you know, just for a couple of bir, which is the, the currency there. And then people would pour their good coffee, the, the real coffee, into the Nescafe bottle. Think about the circularity. Everything imaginable is being brought, brought together. They're trying to find ways to create value. Why? Because that's all you got. That's all you got. And there are networks of relationships, classic Clifford Geertz, anthropological kind of stuff, of relationships in these markets. So I was just scoping it all out and having a great time. And I've written quite a bit about this. This is something that many people, that now I'm moving to Kenya, called Juakali. Juakali in Swahili means hot sun. You just got a table, a soldering gun, and your desire to learn by doing, learn by trying, learn by playing. That's a whole other model of learning and doing. Right? And I love to tell this story about my friend Nimaya. So Nimaya is one of these Juakali workers, or it's in Kenya they describe them as side hustles. You'll meet people who might have a full-time job and it's not enough to live on, so they might just print t-shirts or do this or that, just different gigs. It's a whole other idea of gig, of gig work. You might know that these are 3D printers here that we're looking at here. These 3D printers are being created by Nimaya and his friends, a group called Africa Born 3D. Who cares about 3D printers in a vacuum? But this, it's more a general point about technologies. 90% of these 3D printers are created from electronic waste. Many of you might know that 3D printers print using something that we call filament. These folks can't afford the filament. They don't have any access to filament. What do they do? There's trash, plastic, single-use plastics. Luckily, those things are getting phased out. In, in Kenya. They're using convection and conduction. I think those are the right two chemical things to heat up these plastic bottles and, and then clamp them and they turn them into the filament that they print with. 3D printers are partly made with printed filament. Think about how recursive that is. I'm creating 3D printers out of plastic bottles that I'm printing using other 3D printers. It has this cool like cyclical story to it. And it's not just about the 3D printer, because again, in a vacuum, it's not about any technology, right? But it's about what you might be able to do with it. So Nimaya and his friends have, have print, are now printing thousands of microscopes. Those are microscopes printed with filament that was created from plastic trash bottles. I mean, who, who, who sees things like this, right? How, how can I not be excited, right? And these are a pennies on the dollar, these, these microscopes. They're sitting in hundreds of schools now all over Kenya. And now kids have a chance to, have, to use and, and actually play with microscopes that they never would have had a chance to do so otherwise. So that's Nimaya and I. My friend Sam Alamehu calls himself a rat of Mercato. I mean, that's what the kids call themselves. The, he grew up in the, in the hood right around Mercato. Mercato is tough at times. It's pretty fun, though. And on Sunday, Mercato, all the, all the actual... In Mercato being the market in Addis Ababa, all the, um, mar the, mar the stall, the places with actual keys, close, and it becomes an open-air street market, which is called Men Alesh Tera, which is what have you got? What have you got? That's the Sunday market. And so Sam was a hustler in Mercato. He's now a Stanford graduate who has, uh, has the largest uh, waste-to-energy plant, waste-to-renewable energy plant in all of uh, Ethiopia. And he's now working on stuff in this space in Gabon in West Africa and other regions of the world as well. So even the World Economic Forum buys into this. This is this buzz term you might hear called the circular economy, right? They argue that 3.75, if I'm not mistaken, trillion dollars in the global economy could, be, could emerge, but in the hands of middle and working class people if there were models to have a regenerative economy where all forms of waste could be licensed or made possible or incentivized to be part of a process of creative remaking, reassembling, recreating, redesigning, these sorts of things. And actually, the electronic waste that's accumulated, it's not just about it being waste. It, 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 it infiltrates soil. It infiltrates air. It infiltrates water, right? And it turns out that the amount of electronic waste already is about one and a half times the Great Wall of China, if you, if you look at it all together. So that's a lot, right? So why not think about opportunities? I'm very much a pragmatist, right? Like I, I, I'm always trying to think about where to move, how to make things, how to, how to be part of changing things. At COP27, I know it was, it was, I know there's tons of legitimate criticism of this. There was a fund announced for 
vulnerable nations, which are primarily in, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, in the Global South, right? And so this should be used in a catalytic way to incentivize and support co cooperatives, collectives, entrepreneurs who are, who, so that they can continue to thrive and hire. Because I will tell you this, even though I've said a very positive story about Nehemiah and, and others, they are, they, they, they are desperate for resources. And, and this is something that I can describe in a lot more detail. So uh, this is one of many visions that look at it, it looks at environmental challenges as re re you know, regenerative opportunities. But I want to speak to some one other theme, and then I'll close this talk, which is something powerful that I've been writing about and studying for, I don't know, about a decade or so. Because I used to be really into community radio. I have a background in, in, as a punk DJ and hip hop DJ when I was in college. I was a part radio DJ, and I got really into radio. And then I started to re see that in many different parts of the world, w radio is a very, very powerful oral technology. Many indigenous peoples have languages that were forbidden to be written. It's very cheap. It's something that's low cost. You can repair it very easily. And in many parts, especially of South America and Latin America, community radio thrives. I've met. Aymara feminist collectives who run radio stations in Bolivia. I can just tell you a million stories of it. So that model, the community radio movement, has started to think about what do digital networks look like in the image of community radio, right? Where all of us are owners of these systems. So this is a project that I've had a chance to spend some time with, run by kids of Zapatistas in Chiapas. Uh, and it's called Iktakop. In Celtal, it means words in the wind. And basically, what these kids did is they built what we call a mesh network, right? Where you can have one, what they call backlink, backhaul, I think they call it, linked to the wider internet. And then you split the link in, in the local community so that everyone is sharing in the bandwidth and sharing in the cost. And that's important to, to, because that intranet that they created was the basis of their community radio system. And that intranet also has been critical in, in, in local communications and local organizing. And these folks, this community, it's called Abasolo. It's really near Ocosingo, which is where the Zapatista rebellion started in 93. In, in, in Abasolo, they actually can't afford a single backhaul link in their community because it's just too expensive for the network providers, you know, who tend to be uh, pretty, re pretty repugnant, just like our Verizons and so on. Um, don't want to go there. So what these guys did, can you believe this? 20 kilometers away, they bought a landline connection, and they figured out a, a way to put multiple towers to send the signal from the landline to their community, because they had the local geographical knowledge of where to relay the signals. So I've also been spending time over the past several years with an incredible project, which I recommend all of you take a look at, called Rizomatica. You know, basically riffing on the concept of the rhizome, rhizomatica, or telefono indigena comunitaria, which is indigenous community telephony. I've been spending a lot of time with Zapotec, Mixtec, and Mije communities in the Oaxaca region of Mexico. We have many Oaxacan people here in California who've been building their own cell phone networks for local communications. They tether those networks to voice over IP systems. So I have been on both sides of the call in Oxnard, California, where they have a Zapotec radio station, many of you may not know that, to the Sierras, Sierra Norte in, in Oaxaca, right? So for, again, pennies on the dollar or pesos on the dollar, if you will, uh, people are building these networks of communication to revive Zapotec languages to allow them to bypass corrupt folks who are exploiting them for their agriculture. They're planters, they're farmers of maize and cafe and canela, uh, cinnamon, coffee, and uh, corn. So they're, they're, they're building these networks, and now these folks are, are, are thinking about how can we expand? We could be a rhizome, like meaning we're not going to scalably shift, but we're going to reproduce this model and interpret it in local ways in different parts of the world. Now they're working, these Oaxacan leaders with, who are working with hacker activists, are now working in the Amazon to hack phones that can be connected to HF, or ham radio towers, so people can send images of paramilitaries and mining and fossil fuel corporations to other indigenous peoples over 1,000 mile radius. None of this can be surveilled because it's not using GSM and it's not using internet. 
It's using, it's, it's, I don't know how many of you know how ham radio works, but it bounces signals off the ionosphere. How crazy is that, right? <laughs> so it's just, just our notions of space and territory and, and creativity most notably, and the power of people when they move away from this nonsense and this lie of individuation to where the togetherness is key here. So then last slide, I'll just, and, and I'll just take, end it here, is let's not just make this a, a, the rest of the world story and we're screwed in the US or the West is just a disaster. Sure, I agree with many of those critiques. <laughs> but at the same time, let's recognize it's all about moving beyond the gaze, the nonsensical consumer producer model, user, user or the, the used model, right? Moving away from this, this false, atomized, individuated ontology that sort of sees us as, you know, lemmings to be dopamined up, strung out, right? I mean, I think, Laura, Laura and your performance really showed that. I felt that, right? That's why I'm not on Instagram, by the way. <laughs> so so, it's, so it's, it's really that, right? And recognizing that actually as planetary beings, as part of a constellation of life and life futures, we have a chance in a, to recognize what is habitable for all of us and build systems that actually recognize that this digital transformation, which is ever changing as we, as we, as we look all around us, is, is one that is ours for the taking. Ours for the taking. And from a policy framework, design framework, social movement framework, all these examples, you just look everywhere and there are these examples. I didn't even tell you about 90% of the things I've written about here. It's all around us. So that's not to say that techno-capitalism isn't a disaster, that it's actually techno-feudalism, right? We're paying rent on Amazon, right? But to recognize that that is, a, is, is, is the spell that's been cast on many of us, and it sure as hell ain't going to be my future or our future if we do something about it. So thank you very much. Perfect. Tim Schwartz from Resistance Systems. Uh, to get us started today, I thought we could take a moment to close our eyes, please. We're just going to take a minute here. I want you to imagine a future where your grandparents' photos have arrived for you, and somehow your grandchildren's photos arrive to them from you. In the future, you know, you're not concerned about how this technology is happening and in, uh, affecting you right now because you feel one with it. You're not concerned about the bad passwords you have from the past. Your new passwords are glorious. You don't have to memorize them. They're just there. You don't have to worry about being tracked all the time because you've considered a new way. You have a new way to move through the world. We were just talking about mindfulness and ways to be as an individual in this, this world that um, can be different. So I want you to envision this future, one where your financial security, you're not worried about someone taking your money. You're not worried about, am I clicking the right box? And one where you can go online, you can do research, you don't have to be concerned who's looking over your shoulder. Open your eyes. That future's now. With resistance systems, we have the tools 
to purify your digital life, not just your body and mind. Wellness can be yours, not just in how you get dressed in the morning, how you feel, how your makeup looks, how your body feels, but in your digital life, in your alternative avatars, they can be purified too. You can feel better about all this. And what I'm gonna offer you today are a set of tools for doing this. Before in our past resistance systems, we focused on clothing for privacy and security. We have clothing with private pockets, things that obscure your face from the digital tracking surveillance systems. Today I'm gonna to introduce you to a new set of uh, digital wellness tools that are kits. And I hope some of you will come along with me. I'd like someone to come up and help me with this in a second. But to start, um, I'm going to introduce three kits to you today. The first is called the Digital Resistance Kit. And this is really for how you can think about dropping off the face and purifying without leaving behind your alternative identities from before and having new ones. The easiest way to leave your, your current digital life is by going anonymous or pseudonymous, without uh, all the things behind you that you've had compiled in your back, uh, back identity, you can start anew. And I'm gonna show you how. Give me one second while I set up this technical system. Hello, thank you. The digital, can you change the light so I don't get this overhead shadow? Thank you. Digital resistance kit is your go bag for identity. It comes with on top a manual for digital resistance, which includes things like how to buy stuff anonymously how to drop off the face of the earth with your digital identity, how to hijack desktops, how to use tablets instead of phones that don't have SIM cards, to hop onto another network at Starbucks with a tablet you've bought in cash so you can research what you need to without being tracked. All this can be yours. Let's flip through quickly. Many of you might know Tor. Also included in the kit. Oh, it's a little hard to see. We'll do it a little bit one by one. We have verified copies of tails that have been wax sealed so you know that no one's tampered with them. Anonymous email accounts, cash. We have some anonymous bit card, Bitcoin and Starbucks gift cards, which can be used to buy VPNs anonymously. And anonymous Visa gift cards as well. Great for buying things when you have to use a credit card. We have an anonymous tablet that's pre-configured with email accounts and anonymous um, Google, Google accounts. These are all wax sealed, so no one has tampered with them. And finally, burner cell phones and burner um, dumb cell phones. So this one can be used to set up signal or other um, things that need uh, a phone number. And then this one doesn't have any connectivity via uh, cell phone signals. So it's the best way to uh, get your cell phone apps without being tracked. Please see me after this talk if you'd like to inquire about purchasing these. Next up. Next up we have Coin Collector. This is to renew your digital financial system. Maybe you've been scared to buy 
crypto coins before. Well, now you can buy it in its own case. Here it is. So in this, we have a portfolio of 10 crypto coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Binance, Ripple, the top 10 from last year. They come with a, coil, a cold USB storage um, on this ledger device, and it's unlocked with codes that are stored and wax sealed on the inside of this. Sorry about the out of focus nature of this. Backups are, are available should this ever be destroyed on your crypto steel here. You can always get a live price with this QR code. To contextualize that, we have the numismatic glossary, which combines definitions um, from previous coin collecting, uh, from the 50s, say, and contemporary coin collecting terms to really give you a sense of where you are in the digital future. One, one you might know, uh, a bag is crypto slang for a large quantity of specific cryptocurrency, alternatively, but less frequently used to refer to the contents of an individual's crypto portfolio. A bag mark, on the other hand, a surface mark or nick or on a coin, usually from contact with other coins in a mint bag, more often seen on large gold or silver coins. Please again, see me after the talk if you'd like to purchase one of these items. And third today, we have our password cleanse kit. And I'm hoping someone from the audience might be able to help me with this. Would anybody like to volunteer for a new password? Come on, there, you sir, please. How are you doing? Good. Do you have any passwords in the past that you are ready to get rid of? Please take a seat. You're welcome to state your name to the audience or skip that. But uh, you don't have to announce it. But do you have any passwords in your in your back that you're scared about that you don't want someone to know? Yes. Okay. Would you be willing to, uh, at least metaphorically, get rid of that tonight? Sure. Okay. So password cleanse is set up to give you a new password. I'm going to try to show this here. These are the steps you're going to be following. Do you mind reading reading the first step up? Step out. Step one: put on the ring. Please take it. Does it matter? Great. Yeah. Uh, step two, drop the five dice into the hole at the top. There you go. Step three is, I'll, I'll help you out so you don't have to read all the long ones, but if you want to open up the book, you're going to randomly order these dice and try to find a new word based on this number in this book. What you're going to do now is construct a new password randomly decided by these dice out of the words associated in this book. If you choose to, you can tell the audience your words as you look them up. Or if you'd like to truly keep this password for yourself, please keep it off camera and keep it to yourself. Camera's up here. So I'd like you to repeat that three times, or two more times, sorry. Repeat it two more times, and then we're gonna write it down on a piece of paper and seal it as an ultimate backup <laughs> so that later on, should you forget it, you have a way to get it back. <laughs> Would you mind doing it two more times? Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, roll the dice. Great. And look up a password, a word. I understand you don't want my influence on your passwords. Exactly. <laughs> it's important work we're doing here. In 
the meantime, while he's looking up passwords, I'll also tell you I have a couple copies of Tails for sale tonight. They've been verified. There's Tails 5.8. Tails is a anonymous bootable operating system. It stands for the Amnesiac Incognito Live System. On it is a USB stick that you can plug into any computer and reboot into a new operating system. It automatically connects to Tor, not just the web browser, but the whole network. Uh, so you, it comes built in with Tor browser, with other anonymous chat tools, and allows you to, to do research, say, uh, if you don't want someone to know what you're looking up, maybe it's just uh, medical information and you don't want insurance companies to know. It allows you to do that from uh, your own home or walk into a library and reboot a library computer into a, an anonymous operating system. Please see me after the talk. Do you have your words? I do. Okay, please write down your password on that piece of paper. Don't show it on the camera. Afterwards, please fold it into a letter packet that could be wax sealed. I'd suggest uh, a couple, a couple extra folds. Oh, perfect! One more should do you. Need to create a center seam, right? Perfect, exactly. I'll help you out here. Great. We're gonna light this wax. Sorry, red cap. <laughs> and you might want to take off the ring so the wax doesn't yeah. melt your finger. Are we going to do this, right? Can you all see it? Sometimes the old security methods are the safest. I would suggest you all have a backup copy of your passwords or password manager file uh, on a USB stick and hide it somewhere. And another one, maybe give to your parents for an ultimate backup or a dead man switch. And I'd leave it there for one more second. You could even blow on it to cool it. Perfect. Do you mind showing the audience? You can put it up to this camera. Thank you very much. If you're interested in a new password, please come and see me after the talk. So one last thing I'll do. See? I just want to talk to you all about how to go about making changes in your digital life. In the same way a meditation practice, you need to practice it daily. Your new digital life, you should devote a time period to it every morning, concentrating on how you can improve and renew your digital life, whether it's a password renewal day, or maybe this morning you need to concentrate on your backup, your backup standards. Spend a little time every day, and you'll get more and more enjoyment, enjoyment and you'll feel more and more confident in your digital life if you do so. Thank you very much. change hats a little bit. Uh, this is my colleague, No Name, and I'm Professor X. We're going to be talking about LA Crypto Party. You want to start? Yes, so I, my hat is on as no name. 
This is how um, I engage in LA Crypto Party with Prof X. So we're just gonna talk about how we, um, how we started, uh, uh, well, Crypto Party, um, which we then renamed a couple of different ways, LA Crypto Party, Crypto Cruisers at one point. Um, we had a couple of different names, so we're just gonna introduce that. So I think the next slide. Um, so there's a third member of LA Crypto Party who is not here, and that is Taze. Um, so I just wanna you know, mention that because Taze is a big part of how we came to be. I mean, Taze is kind of the middle person in how we came to be a Crypto Party. So I'll tell the kind of um, starting story and correct me if I'm wrong, I might make some mistakes along the way, but I think that it was um, 2013, 2014 maybe, around that time. And I think- I think you remember it as post-Snowden and I remember it as pre-Snowden. Yeah, that's an issue. <laughs> um, but it was around that, so it was either like, like recently post-Snowden or maybe it was pre-Snowden. Thank you. Um, and Prof X, you were doing a workshop, I think, at Machine Project, but not as Prof X, or maybe it was as Prof X. We don't know. Maybe it was some other, some other name. Um, and it was on like encryption tools. And for some reason, either scheduling or financial, I couldn't attend the workshop. But a friend of mine, Taze, was at the workshop. And so Taze would funnel all the information to me from the workshop. And so I was learning all the tools vicariously through Taze that Prof X was teaching at this workshop. So it was, I think it was mostly um, how to like send and receive encrypted emails. And then Taze and I decided it would be a really fun idea to start like a crypto party in LA because, uh, and to do something like that and that Prof X would be you know, the person to do it with. And when we initiated communication with you, I think I was put through some kind of test, like can you respond with an encrypted email? And thankfully I could because I had learned those tools through Taze, but they came from Prof X. Um, so that was, I think, the, the test that, which was great because I'm not tech savvy at all. Um, so that's kind of how we started. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how we, we run crypto parties in general. Um, crypto party is a, global phenomenon, you might have heard of it, might not have, because it's not super, super popular, but um, LA never had a crypto party until we started it. Uh, anyway, important part is always knowing your audience, knowing who you're talking to, and I think uh, what separates our crypto party from a lot of them, many of them are very kind of tech-oriented straight away, and we try to open up that space and make it playful in um, different ways like that. And part, part of what that means also is that like, I think you know, a typical crypto party might require that folks arrive with like, their, um, like a piece of paper with you know, proving basically that, that, um, that they are tech savvy enough to be part of this crypto party and we didn't want to gatekeep in that way because if we did, well, I wouldn't be part of it to begin with. Um, and also like that just wasn't the focus or the point that we wanted to, to make. We wanted to make it a space that emphasizes the party and crypto party. Um, where folks can come and like learn tools at any level. And if they're already super savvy, then we can have you know, discussions about what that means and why it might be important. Um, a list of different crypto parties we've thrown. One that uh, No Name just reminded me of is we did one just basically about like parents and their kids tracking each other and did a discussion around that and having parents and kids come together to talk about it was pretty interesting. And I, I don't think we even involved hands-on technology in that one, but um, dark web treasure hunt, always a favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. Whistleblowing with the press, um, cell phone safe. I think one of my favorite ones was kill your phone. I think the official title was actually kill your phone and do your nails. Um, and we had all kinds of, uh, we were gonna start by making like uh, fairway pouches um, to kind of block a uh, cell signal, but somehow we got into a manicure station that was part of that workshop, and I think people were doing... Magnetic nails yeah, for magnetic like... Yeah, nails. Trashing card readers or something. Um, yeah. Some common topics that we've used, so tools for activists, becoming a whistleblower, communicating securely, becoming anonymous, traveling with data, buying things on the dark web, blocking location tracking. Oh, I was gonna mention in, in regards to one of the earlier presentations, we always, or we sort of typically had a sign that said conspiracy theorist this way, and then we would have a corner designated for conspiracy theorist talks. 
so it didn't derail um, a lot of the other things we were doing. You, some of you might find that useful in general. Um, yeah, if anybody's heard the idea of threat modeling, that's something that comes up at a lot of other crypto parties and a lot of other places where security is talked about. Um, threat modeling is how you kind of build your own uh, threat model of who are the actors and what do they want from you. We find that a lot of the time uh, that is distracting because a lot of people have tons of different threat models. So in individual work, it can be helpful, but uh, for broader conversations, it can kind of get distracted. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so some of our approaches um, that we yeah, pretty much do consist or have done consistently, name tags with um, uh, different names, which is always fun. I think we were more or less consistent. I might have like toggled between a couple different names. Taze was really intent on building um, like wanted to have kind of, I don't know, like, cred. yeah, cr like crypto cred, uh, not as in the currency, um, but wanted to have, or, or like hacker cred. So Taze was trying to build a name uh, with, by Taze. Um, I'd be curious to know actually how, how that's turned out. I think in general, like setting the stage for people when they come into a space, choosing an alias or a costume gets your, you thinking in a different way in order to have these conversations. And so it's always been really helpful for us. Um, we always do a PSA just about like low level technology solutions that people can adopt. Um, so right now, if you don't have it, maybe download Signal on your phone and try to use that over iMessage or regular messages. It's uh, much more secure. Costumes and disguises also is fun. Um, and I think part of like part of why making it fun and more approachable was important was um, at least in my experience, a lot of the conversations around encryption, I mean, it was like a white bro club. Um, so the question of like, why does this matter? The answers to that like ranged pretty wildly. And sometimes it would take a minute to really think about how those responses um, change depending on context. So the kinds of folks that would come to the workshops um, also like there was just a, a really um, interesting and generative variety of folks and interests, like, I mean, there were folks who were super, super savvy um, and were, part of, were probably part of those clubs that I was mentioning, you know, part of that white bro club that, that I felt was um, exclusive or maybe not of interest to me. Um, but then there were also folks who were coming because they wanted to uh, acquire better, like, encryption tools to take data, for instance, to travel um, in countries where there were dictatorships and they couldn't, and th say they were doing queer activism or something, and they could not actually pass through security with, you know, um, data. So the stakes differ, and I think bringing folks with who have different kinds of knowledges of those stakes together, um, for me, was a big takeaway of, of Crypto Party. I'll just say, to add on to that, there's a, obviously a big theme running through privacy and security that is a hacker with a black hoodie on all the way up in their basement and they're really tech savvy and we try to break that in many different ways. You can see from my earlier work kind of doing the opposite or this just opening it up in a really fun way. And yes, we cannot cover everything. Um, yeah, more research resources to point to. Which also sometimes might mean like collaborating with folks and you know doing kind of joint, uh, joint workshops. Um, but research and, and conversations, I think, were, were a big part of, of Crypto Party. <laughs> Self-explanatory. See you. Yeah, that's it for Crypto Party. Do you want to do it from now? No, oh, okay. I just have my notes here. It's super lo-fi because <laughs> I don't have a printer. <laughs> So now I'm just going to put on a different hat. Um. <laughs> we're, we're really, you know, just we have one, one line of thought for each of us, and we don't wear different hats or do different things. Well, I think we're trying to apply maybe what, you know, um, Ramesh was talking about in terms of having agency over multiple identities. I think that's the, you know, real, the um, real-time application. So the hat I'm going to put on now is as Dan Bustillo, um, and I'm just going to... Um, uh, mention it's very brief. I'm just going to mention a couple of things that I'm currently researching and what I'm working on. Um, yeah, the, I think the website for Redcat ha says that I'm an artist working on data pr privacy. That's fascinating, but that's not <laughs> that's not what I work on. Um, 
So other research that I do, um, I will say kind of the research that I'm currently doing is um, uh, like right now culminating into my dissertation, but a lot of it comes from a creative praxis, even though right now I'm writing about other people's creative praxis. Um, so, you know, initially I was interested in kind of surveillance and thinking about surveillance, um, but from a kind of place of both research and practice, um, the through line is that I'm still interested in praxis, um, I just write about other folks' praxis. One thing that I um, noticed and learned about, you know, the more I got into not just kind of thinking about surveillance, but also delving into like surveillance studies, is that the tendency tends to be very top down, which um, in some sense kind of, you know, replicates like the way the state sees. Um, and whereas in kind of like lived life, uh, resistive acts or resistive praxis, like practice um, are communal projects. Um, and so that got me thinking about how, you know, creative, resistive media praxis are tools for world building. Um, and so then I just got, things just got closer and closer to my own body and so I became interested in, well, what kinds of world making projects, you know, uh, are possible for trans Latinx communities through, um, digital and analog uh, creative miss slash uses of, um, of media. And so this brought me to kind of uh, thinking about what I'm calling counter security media. And so counter security media is um, not just a kind of resistive misuse or strategic use of media, it's also a tool to, uh, to build community. So it's a tool for world making. And even though my focus is mostly on kind of like trans world making and, and trans Latinx world making within that, um, as a tool, you know, I think it speaks to and probably resonates across a lot of um, communities uh, who are um, like minoritarian communities or communities who, who um, uh, form in spite of being excluded from, from various uh, spaces. Um, so, so yeah, so that's kind of like how I'm thinking about counter security media and it can be analog or digital. The important kind of takeaway for me is that it's about use. So not necessarily about building an alternative platform or system, which also is super important and, and super badass as we saw in Ramesh's uh, uh, talk. Um, but it can also be about use and, and strategic use of an already existing platform, even if it is a corporate um, privatized uh, platform that is mining our data and commodifying our, our feelings and existence. Um, so I'll just give like two, I think, or I think I have three examples of counter security media and I'll kind of close out there. Um, so some examples of counter security media that are super analog um, are the use of prison letter writing campaigns. Um, and so in my work, I look at um, different kinds of prison letter writing activism by um, trans letter organizations such as Black and Pink, Trans Latina Coalition and Trans Pride Initiative. Um, and so I'm thinking about the letter as media in the sense that, you know, the letter as a media form um, in the case of prison uh, letter writing activism, um, you know, mediates gender and reinscribes transness in sex segregated carceral spaces where gender nonconformity actually targets people for further violence or elimination. So that could mean, for instance, for trans femmes to be placed in, you know, um, uh, male prisons for, for men or detention centers for men or for trans folks to be placed in solitary where they are often denied uh, access to resources, including you know, basic survival medical <laughs> resources. Um, so in this context, you know, reinscribing um, uh, gender affirming, for instance, like letters becomes you know, a tool for um, uh, survival you know, in, in some sense in terms of like recognition, but also community building. Um, so one example is this one, which is, um, a screenshot from uh, a promotional material from Trans Latina Coalition as part of their Free Kelly campaign. Um, and which was in, um, they launched this in 2020 and it was um, so a liberation campaign for a detained uh, Trans Latina woman who was in, um, uh, who was being detained in Aurora uh, by ICE. Um, she was detained for like about three years and eventually released uh, in part as a result of this campaign. So the liberation, liberation campaign involved 
everything from you know um, community calls, for instance, demanding her release, all the way to sending birthday cards, like a birthday card, you know, in her in her name to her in a place that is actively, you know, a racialized and gendered regime that is actively trying to kill her. Um, so this kind of survival becomes a community, a community, you know, um, uh, building project. Um, and the way I'm thinking about, you know, um, projects like this that are not just, I mean, I'm sure I'm theorizing them in the work, but, but it's also like, this is life work. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, Gloria Ansaldúa's notion of the wild tongue, which makes strategic use of two colonial languages, English and Spanish, but ultimately doesn't care for either. Like, it's not about, you know, coming up with a different language. It's about using strategically the ones that exist, even if they're shitty or even if they're lethal. Um, and so I'm thinking about her kind of, you know, the way she's thinking about the wild tongue and how trans prison letter writing campaigns apply that wild tongue um, to the letter genre um, as a way to reinscribe transness. Another um, example is this prison prayer, uh, which was a flyer, and I have permission to um, uh, to display this information and also to name the. Um, uh, the um, organization who used it, but I'm going to be strategic now because I know this is being streamed. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that, um, that I do have consent to use this. Um, so this flyer was um, uh, circulated by a, um, um, a trans-led um, uh, um, advocacy group, um, and the flyer was um, brought into um, uh, prisons, uh, passed around in jails to support a national prison strike in 2018. Um, and here, like, part of why, you know, so prison systems have, like, really detailed surveillance, um, you know, mailroom protocols. Um, so, for instance, in prisons in Florida and Texas, you can't send now, like, uh, cards if the paper is too thick because they're afraid that, like, drugs are being smuggled into the cards or whatever kind of contraband. I mean, everything is contraband. Like, if I put a, a sticker on a letter that I'm sending in, that's it, sometimes it'll get sent back as contraband. Like, um, all this to say that it's heavily, you know, kind of surveilled, um, but sometimes that there's something about the analog medium that can allow for things to pass through. So in this case, at first glance, you know, uh, it looks like a, a prayer, you know, a prayer flyer, um, but it's actually a call for, it's an, it's an organizing call um, that lists very specific, you know, demands for, for the strike and also um, uh, things that folks can do to join the strike. Um, okay, so another example of a counter security media a um, practice that is digital um, is, um, would involve, for instance, creative strategies of what I'm thinking about as digital testimonios on social media platforms, um, such as TikTok. Um, and here I'm thinking about Jose Munoz's idea of a problem as an ethno-racialized social feeling. So like, you know, he draws from Du Bois um, and thinking about the affect of being told you are a problem and how that is a racialized affect. Um, and I, and I follow three trans Latinx micro celebrities on social media, Rose Montoya, Selena Briar, and Ezra Michelle, as they each trans the problem ascribed to trans expression online. So if trans expression is considered a quote unquote problem for the platform, in other words, it's a problem for you know, content moderation, it's a problem for what constitutes you know, um, a violation of, uh, of a community guideline, what constitutes um, um, actual transphobia or when, for instance, uh, a trans user uses trans as a tag and that same tag gets them flagged, right? And there have been court cases that have, um, that, that trans folks have put together to prove that this does in fact happen. Um, the takeaway is that trans expression becomes crafted as a problem for social media platforms. Um, and yet folks remain visible on these platforms despite the kind of, you know, push towards um, a, a platform disappearance, whether it's by way of turf troll or, or algorithm um, or a combination of all three. Um, so some of the different strategies that, um, that I follow are, for instance, um, uh, Rose Montoya um, in particular, I think on this slide, yeah, engages in what I'm calling uh, platform transing, which um, you know, is the use of one platform to document and publish the censorship of another. And of course, this is not, you know, uh, solely used by trans communities, um, but it is a strategic use of a corporate platform to call out and, and publish, even if it eventually gets taken down, 
um, you know, uh, the, the kind of um, the censorship, the anti-trans censorship of a different platform. And Montoya is really interesting because um, she compiled um, a whole series of videos on YouTube called TikTok T that like document the different ways in which she was um, censored on TikTok and gets into even like, you know, the stakes of um, the specific citation. So for instance, a common one was she was being reported for uh, violating community guidelines for serious pornography when when she was doing like say a trans 101 educational video, you know, like, um, so here like trans educational content becomes flagged as pornographic and then that becomes criteria to um, have counts, accounts deleted. And so some of the other ways, and of course you know, this happens to many, many users and not just trans users of course, um, but there are other kinds of creative strategies within that to remain trans visible while also um, publishing a critique of that platform. And here I think of Selena Briere is really interesting um, and her content has changed a lot and a lot of um, her work has also um, been either removed, deleted, and, and of course, you know, she might have, you know, choose to remove things as well. Like I don't wanna discount that because we can change our identities online. Um, and she has used her platform for a range of different things. Um, now it's kind of more geared towards like her music career uh, and modeling, but she also has done a lot of like comedic work. And in her comedic work, um, what I found to be really uh, super brilliant and I, and I follow a, a lot of that or unpack it in, in my research is the use of comedic discourse or Spanglish for instance, to kind of trans the conventions of transition vlogs or you know, uh, trans content that can be more like legible as trans because it follows specific conventions. So for instance, if you know, a um, trans educational one-on-one -on -one video is considered like, you know, more likely to be flagged because it's, uh, you know, quote unquote pornographic, then, you know, how, how can someone make something both legible to the trans community, but not super legible to folks who would flag it as, as a problem? Um, and some of those strategies might be, for instance, not tagging things at all, <laughs> or like, you know, doing a, say, a transition vlog style um, breast update, you know, uh, video, but not tagging it as, you know, trans, um, or not tagging it as like, you know, um, transition vlog or something like that. And instead using maybe like Spanglish, so rather than like a, a breast update video, it might be a teta update. Um, and then using kind of comedic discourse to disguise like the content so that at first glance, the video doesn't seem like it's going to be, you know, a, a transition update, but it, but it seems like it's gonna be kind of a, a, um, a goofy comedic, uh, you know, skit on, on TikTok. So those are just some of the strategies, I think that's it, um, that I kind of uh, detail. And here are just some um, screenshots from two folks who use uh, comedic discourse to kind of uh, trans the problem that is ascribed to trans expression, whether it's Selena Briar doing an amazing skit on uh, TSA, which I feel like uh, encapsulates like the gist of trans critiques of maybe security studies, um, or Ezra Michelle who does a lot of um, kind of comedic skits as well. And that's kind of what I'm researching now, so I'll just end there. I forgot, to, uh, I forgot to plug my book. If you want to be a whistleblower, public service, whistleblowing, disclosure, and anonymity. <laughs> so what an exciting conference we've had. Um, what, these five... Four presenter, five presenters we had just on this panel. Professor X, No Name, Tim, Dan, Ramesh. Um, and then earlier, uh, looking at the mental states of where we find ourselves trapped on the grid, and then even a critique of platforms. So let's just thank all of our presenters so far today as a group. Uh, remember, um, Tim has some security resources and art and something in between. Um, if you'd like to check any of that out, I know all of us are going to be around. A few announcements. So announcement number one, um, we are having an evening event with Hirt and Ben. Um, I've been told by the house that it is separately ticketed, so if you already have a ticket for this event, there's another ticket that you'll have to get for that event, so just heads up. Um, that two, um, 
We have a sizable break for dinner, so I have a couple instructions for some places you could go if you're curious, if you don't know downtown LA very well. There's a couple strip molly type things very close. You, you, you can do that, that's fine. Um, and in the green room, we have a little leftover Chipotle too. Um, but there is the Cal Plaza, which is okay. The, who knows what's open there? Uh, but it's right past Mocha. But that's kind of helpful because right past Mocha is also the funicular, the angel's flight, the last funicular after the long storied history of rails that were chronicled in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And uh, it will take you up and down and right at the end of it is Grand Central Market. If you would rather just prefer to walk there, you can just go east down second and when you hit hill, take a right and you'll see it. It's undeniable, it'll be hit there. Or if you like little Tokyo, like I do, um, you can actually just keep heading down on east, and it's going to be about mm, half or three quarters mile down. It's, it's pretty easy to get to. There's other stuff, I'm sure. The red cat people will be in the know. And then um, I think that's about it for now. So I look forward to seeing uh, many, if not all of you, back at 830. And if you have any questions, let me know. I think the lounge is, is the lounge going to be open the whole time? Yes, maybe, no? Who knows? Probably. Um, and they have some drinks and some other stuff. But otherwise, I'll see you in a few hours. Thanks, everybody.